Hey everyone, the girls are back together again. Yes, we are. I am here with my favorite Canadian sidekick, Kia Naka of Coexist. And we are back where it all began in beautiful downtown Dahlonega, Georgia, for a very, very special reason. Yes, it is, because Karen and I will be doing a screening, private screening of our very first short film together. That's right. Our short film is entitled My First Breath, the story of Carl Gibson. And it is a deeply personal account of how a man from the mountains of North Georgia whose life was once consumed by literally a dark abyss of drug addiction, found faith, perseverance, and unwavering determination to restore his family and completely change his life. This is a remarkable story of redemption, transformation, and the power of faith in someone's life. Today on this episode, Carl Gibson himself joins us along with others from the film, Pastor Bill Hutchison and Carl's son Nick. Also on the podcast today is one of the film crew members, Matt Scott, who took hours of footage and edited to create magic and a universal message of hope that will be on the minds of people long after they see this film. Together today, we're going to give you a snapshot of the film's content. We're going to share the highs and the lows, the pivotal moments, and some deeply personal moments that didn't make the film, but powerful revelations that created Carl's unbelievable and remarkable transformation. If you're looking for a story that's bound to inspire and uplift, whether you're facing your own struggles or simply seeking hope in the midst of life's trials, you're in the right place today. Hey, Kia, let's start a conversation. Let's do it. I think before we embark on this journey, I want to say to you, Kia, I think that there's no one out there that I would have chosen to do this with other than you. This is quite a shift from what we have been producing together with Coexist and Unconditionally Her. And we are producers, story collectors, but this path was very unfamiliar and one we had to do. And I just need to stop before we even start and say thank you for your incredible talent, your friendship. Walking down this path that was unfamiliar for both of us, your insight and your dedication to what has turned out to be this incredible journey, over 10,000 miles together, has been in this journey. And you're just like my sister and closer today than ever. Oh, well, thank you, Karen. This has been such an amazing ride for me as well, and I can't wait to continue to do this with you. So, Carl. Yes. What are you feeling right now? Very anxious, very nervous, and excited at the same time. If you can feel all those emotions in one, that's it. I'm looking forward to see how God is going to use this and to glorify him. Uh, It's going to be good. It's going to be good. I have not been able to see the video, just a trailer, just as everyone else has. So I don't know what to expect, but I know it will be good. I know it will be good. Nick, you're in the house. How are you feeling about all this? Pretty nervous, (laughs) to be honest. Before we get too deep in the conversation, um, we want to let everyone know that this podcast is recorded one day before the movie premiere of My First Breath. The story of Carl Gibson uh, that is premiering at Dahlonega Baptist Church. Um, This is one day before your life, mine and Kia's life, Matt's life is going to completely change. And that has been so apparent in everything that we do. But for those who don't know how all this story came about, I want to kind of backtrack for a second. Carl, you were serving as associate director of Jeremiah's Place, which is a transitional community for the homeless located in Dahlonega, Georgia when I was hired as executive director, and that's how it all started. Now, it was an interesting ride from the beginning because you weren't real sure about me. No, I wasn't sure about you. We don't like change. And so when you came in, uh, you were pretty intimidating. You know, you were very professional, uh, something that old country boy like myself wasn't used to. And so I uh, typed up a letter of resignation 
and I wasn't going to even give you a chance. And you are a Tennessee volunteer. Absolutely. Go Vols. I wasn't upset that you were going to resign. I understand. Growth happens and all. But dang it, Carl. It was, I'm, I'm a Tennessee volunteer friend. You didn't give me a chance. We all make mistakes. <laughs> Please forgive me. That is now heard all across the world. Carl, you are forgiven. Thank you. Don't ever do it again. Yes, ma'am. Go Vols. That's word from the Canadian there. Go Vols. Okay. <laughs> Um, but here's the beauty. You hung, you hung in there, right? And we just kept kind of going and um, the unfamiliar and the uncertainty began to fade and a true family was formed. And you and I saw some pretty heartbreaking situations together. And we also saw real transformations of life occur through this, um, homeless community, families reunited, families brought out homelessness, true miracles happen. So saying, I guess this work was very emotional. I think, began to help you and I, as well as Katie, began to build a bond. And I don't know how it happened, but just one day we were just talking and you began sharing your personal story. And I was taken aback, quite frankly, that you were still alive. And I, I it literally sitting in front of me and a professional, upstanding and treasured citizen of Dahlonega. And you had this horrifying past, but the more I kept learning through you and through the community and through the church, which honestly was a backbone, and you'll learn more of that, and a source of strength that during your transformation, I was captivated. And I'm going to share with you something tonight that you do not know. Um, it was, ooh, hang on. It was actually my mom who, after countless conversations of me telling my mom about you, she said, Karen, I don't think you're captivated by his story. I think you're convicted to share it. And I've not shared that. So long story long, this is how we are, and this is where we are, and it is in a nutshell. <laughs> so we want to go back, way back, Carl, and, and begin this story. So let's go back to age of seven, let's say, where it began. Can you tell your story? Growing up in my household with my mom and dad, they were very loving parents, very loving parents. But my dad, he fought demons on his own, just as I did as I grew older. But my dad was an alcoholic, uh, abusive alcoholic. And so I seen things that children shouldn't have to see. And you try to numb yourself to that because you lived in that. And so at the age of seven, my dad would buy me motorcycles, go karts, whatever, and I could go to the woods. And I started experimenting with huffing gas, just a simple smell of gas. You wouldn't think anything of it, but you consume a lot of it. You go to a different place, not reality, you know. I would try to numb myself as much as possible and not even know what I was doing at the age of seven and why I was doing it at the age of seven. I thought I was just normal, but later on I figured out that I was just trying to escape the reality of living a, not a tough life, because like I said in the beginning, my mom and dad were very loving. Even though my dad was a severe alcoholic, he was a functioning alcoholic. He worked daily. He worked hard to provide for me and my sister and my mom, and uh, I never doubted his love, even though he'd done these things. He still showed love, just not in a physical, emotional kind of way. He was always there for us when we needed things. He would make sure we had those and that kind of thing. Uh, seven years old, I uh, started experimenting with just huffing gas. And I want to put this into a little bit of perspective here because I have a six-year-old. And so for me, I'm like, he's in grade one. He's just learning to read and write. And so for me, this is just hard to imagine my child at this young age, just learning how to write his numbers the proper way, going through his mind, seeing the stuff, and this is what he's doing. So for me, it's a little bit of a different perspective to try and imagine. Yeah, you just, you don't expect someone of that age doing things of that nature. And where did I learn how to do that? Why did I learn how to do that? And I think I just fell upon that, you know. Uh, 
you just get a smell and, and it made you feel different. And then you continue in that process of smelling and huffing. And it eventually took you a different place that you just really can't put into words. You talk about your relationship with your dad, and that is a main part of this film, is the ability that you had because you were searching for that love, but ultimately that love that you were not feeling took you down a path of destruction. And through the process, though, at age 18, you found out you were going to be a dad. You had from age seven to age 18, and then all of a sudden at age 18, you find out there's a child coming, but it still didn't stop the drug use. I think at that age, it was already out of control at that point, and I was enjoying the addiction process. Uh, that makes sense. I didn't want to quit anything because I liked that numb feeling. I didn't have to deal with life. I didn't have to deal with knowing I was becoming a father. I didn't have to deal with school. I didn't have to deal with anything. I would just engulf myself in an addiction, and uh, I didn't have to worry about that. I could run from life. And I was running from life. I didn't want to hit it. And looking back, that's tough on a man. I used to deal with those feelings of... You know, I feel cowardly. I feel like a coward because it wasn't taught those skills how to deal with life. And so I was a coward at that time, you know. I was running from things in my life. So I'm going to ask something, and this may be, we're going to dive into some stuff that's going to be hard to talk about. So let's talk about the, the decision you had to make about your son and tell us what decision that was. Hmm. It's a very emotional decision. Uh, me and my wife, we were using, and somehow it got back to family and children's services. And one day they knocked on our door and uh, told us that they were taking my son. And... Uh, And so uh, you would think any parent would uh, stop using, and Penny did, Penny did. I give Penny all the credit on that. She did well. But for some reason, I did not quit using, and I chose to continue to use, even though my son meant the world to me. And uh, that was tough because... It seemed like I didn't care for Nick, you know, but I did. I loved him with all my heart, and I still love him with all my heart. But I would not quit using. They made a family plan, as Family and Children's Services does, and they would come out and scream me each week, and week in, week out, week in, week out, I would continue to show up dirty, and so they could not put Nick back in our care at that time, and me and my wife uh, are my girlfriend at that time. She, we weren't married. We didn't get married until later on, And but I say we. I pretty much persuaded Nick Penny to uh, sign over our rights as parents to my mom and dad, and the reason I'd done that because my dad was clean at this time, and so I knew the best care for Nick would be with my mom and dad at that time, you know, and still I would have access to my son. I could go and visit with him anytime I wanted to. It was sort of like he wasn't gone from me, you know, if that makes sense. But because I was never there anyway, I was there physically, but I wasn't there mentally as a father. So it was just the same process or same lifestyle and things that I was living. It was just better for Nick to be with my mom and dad. And thank God, thank God they were there because there's no telling where Nick would have wound up at. But I knew where Nick was at, and I knew he was safe, and I knew he was loved on, and he was getting the love that he needed. So, And ultimately, Carl, he went to live with the dad you struggled with. So tell us about how you feel about that or how you feel about it now. 
Well, like I just said, my dad was sober. Let me go back. My mom and dad got custody of three other children when we were younger. I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And uh, we got my mom and dad got custody of her sister's kids. And so my dad had to clean his act up for them to go into court system and and get custody of these children. And so uh, I was okay with it because I knew my dad was in his right mind and he loved Nick with with so much of his heart, you know. Uh, him and Nick would uh, ride to the store every day. He would spoil Nick. Nick setting up in the truck. I'll never forget Nick just popping it on. Back then, you didn't have to buckle your children in, and so you could just ride in the back seat or whatever in the back of the truck. But uh, he loved Nick dearly. He, him, and my mom. Nick was their first grandchild, but I was fine with my mom and dad taking care of Nick because I knew he was going to be took care of, especially with my mom around. So, and your drug use was just getting way worse. Oh, it yes. wasn't getting better when you saw Nick riding around with your dad did it click that was the furthest thing from my mind uh as an addict or as myself as an addict there was only one thing that i worried about and that was getting high i didn't care about people i didn't care about i mean it was obvious i didn't care about my son but i did but I was worried about getting high and running from life. Living in a small town is really tough because here locally, there was nothing for teenagers to do except ride the roads and get drunk and get tore up, you know, and that's exactly what I did. And I was engulfed already. You know, I started doing methamphetamine and cocaine by the age I was 13, I was selling. And so, uh, yeah, I was fully engulfed and just didn't care, didn't care. Were you ever, Carl, and this is the word, resentful watching your dad with Nick, that you didn't get that life with your dad? Absolutely, absolutely. And I didn't think about that till later on as, as an older adult until I did get clean. Nick had the life that I wanted through my dad and my mom, but I... I I think God knew what he was doing in that whole situation because he knew what was best for Nick, regardless of what I wanted. But yes, there's there were a little resentment there because, but there was happiness as well because he was getting what I desired as a young boy. But uh, again, mom and dad, they loved us, but it just wasn't that, that physical. Mom was, mom was, but dad, he was a manly man, you know, you, you just didn't show emotions as a man. And that's the way I was brought up. And it was hard for me to show emotions when I had children and I had a girlfriend or my wife or whatever. You know, you had an expectation or I felt like I did to be a manly man. That makes me want to ask a question here. And this is I'm presuming everyone will see this film. So I hope you all go watch this film. But there's a part in the film, Carl, that I've always wanted to ask you about it since we've recorded it and it was you would say to your dad I love you dad and he would respond yep, yep. and your response to that was I didn't know until later in life or you didn't realize maybe the meaning of that or why he did that can you share what that was oh uh, yeah most children when you go to bed you know you tell your mom and dad I love you and get the words back I love you uh, but Dad was very hardcore, and I can remember as a small boy, my mom would always tuck me in and tell me she loved me, kiss me and stuff. But as I ran to my bed, I would always, I could see my dad, he would sit, be sitting there watching TV, and I would holler, you know, I love you, Dad. Yep. And that was the response that I would always get. And I started questioning, does he love me? You know, does he love me? It was just normal after a while. So I didn't expect I love you out of it until later on in life. My dad got really bad off sick. And I asked him one day, I said, 
why do you say yep? He says, because you should already know how much I love you. Oh, wow. So. Oh, I didn't see that one coming. That was one thing, Carl, when I was telling, we had done a radio interview with someone, and I said, Carl changed me that day because I was very mindful of when my little guy, Jack, says, I love you, Mom, and I'm always mindful now of if I'm having a really crappy day, I have to always respond to that because that effect that that has on a child when they're young can keep going. Absolutely. And so that when you said that that day when we were filming back in June, that has stuck, even if that's the one of 900 things that stuck with me after that film. <laughs> but I was like, I always have to remember that. Yeah, and that's something I would tell parents today. No matter how aggravated you get with your children, how bad work was, or how stressful life is, always take a moment and say, I love you to your children, because one day you're not going to be able to say that to them. You're either going to be passed along or they're going to grow up and get married and you not have that conversation each day. And I do try that with Nick and Angel as well. I do tell them before they go to bed, I love them. And I hope they know just how much they do mean to me because that's a blessing from God. Both of those children are. And I took that for granted for many years. And I'd be darned if I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. So. Nick, you're here, and you are now 30 years old? Yes, ma'am. I know we've talked about this when we were filming, and Matt, uh, Matt Scott, you are just incredible, and you wouldn't give up until we got a hold of Nick and set him down. And Nick's, you, you don't like really to be in the spotlight or even on this podcast. No, I do not. <laughs> but you loved living with your grandparents. Yes, I did. And how long were you there for the whole time span that you lived with them? I was probably there to about 12 or 13. When they passed away, you had to go back and live with Carl, and that was hard. It was very hard. What were the emotions like? What was it like returning home to Carl and Penny after being away from them? Furious. I was furious, really, because... Like my dad said, he had his drug problems when he was younger, and that affected my life because I really didn't get to see him much, but when I did see him, he was in the right mind, so I really didn't know as a kid. I was just like, when they when I had to move back, I was like, I don't want to do this. When you moved back, the fights continued, the drug use continued, you were thrown back into this, you had had a very loving childhood. And then it all came crumbling down. And you had, I mean, how many people say, well, I had to go back and live with my parents. That's super hard. And I will say this is not in this film. There will be an extended version of the film, but this part is not in the short film. So I want those who are listening to, who see the film to know that the battles between your mom and your dad got more and more intense. But you are the unsung hero here, and that is so important for people to know, and I will say this to you until I can no longer say it. What you did was brave. You went to school, and you did something that ultimately saved your family. Take us back to that day. Uh, and and how, before, old you were. And oh, how old you were. And how old you were. Yeah, and how old you were. I was probably about 13, and uh, the night before that, um, I was really having a bad day because my parents were arguing that night before. And so I barely got some sleep. So I had to go to school the next day and I was worried. And I was just thinking to myself, like, how can I change this? And you took a step and you did what? I told my counselor that uh, my dad was abusive to my mom and he's always really angry. And I was uh, scared of him. And what happened after that? He straightened up his life. But Carl, something happened to you after that, too. The world came crashing down around that time. Absolutely. Nick went to school and done that. Nick actually saved my life. And I've never told Nick that. Uh, but thank you, son. You, uh, you done something that was, like Karen said, very brave. You changed 
the whole family, and you never realized it, what you exactly did, but I thank you from the bottom of my heart, because if you hadn't have done that that day, things wouldn't definitely be the way they are today, because I had no intentions of changing my life. But Nick went to school and told that to his counselor. She contacted the cops, and I was at work. I'll never forget it. I was at my workstation, and I look over my shoulder, and I see several cops walk into the building where I was working. And me not thinking nothing about it, they came right up to me and asked if I was Carl Gibson. I said yes, and they said, Mr. Gibson, turn around and put your hands behind your back. You were being arrested. And my life changed at that moment drastically because I had just lost everything that I wanted, and that was my family. Even though I didn't act like I wanted that family, but I did it deep down inside. You know, we all dream of things when we get older. I had that dream, but I just did not have the capabilities of achieving that dream because of my addiction, but Nick changed everything. I went to jail. I was incarcerated for domestic violence, and I spent a couple days in jail there, and I was got released, but uh, I had the TPO on me, so I couldn't be around Penny or anything, but really cool thing about it was, even though Nick was scared to death of me and and my addiction, This young man did not leave my side. He would sleep with me. He would stay with me, but he would visit back and forth with both of us. But Nick, he knew that my world was turned upside down, but he never left my side. He would hold me, and I'll never forget that. And uh, after all that I had put him through and all the things that he had seen and dealt with, just as me as a small boy, He was dealing with the same things, but he still loved me unconditionally. But life changed dramatically after that, but it changed in a great way. Yeah. Nick, when you went and you told the counselor, and we're all getting emotional here, you told the counselor, and your daddy didn't come home. Take me back to where you were mentally. I was devastated because I knew I caused it. So I beat myself up over it many days, you know, and I just missed him like crazy. And when he got home, I could spend much of the time I wanted to with him. Like you said, I held him. And I just felt the love, you know, just the connection we had. When you told the counselor, Nick, did you do it because you were angry or did you know that you were doing it in the outcome that it would help him. I was angry. I was really angry. I was just tired of it. What I really love about this specifically is that there are other children out there that experience this, and you've really just shown them, Nick, that there is another way and they're not by themselves. And I think that in itself just is showing all the strength that you have and that you did have as a young teenager. And I just like want to thank you on behalf of everyone that is out there right now suffering through that, that it will, it can get better and it will get better. And, you know, you did it for your dad for a reason. And I think there is a reason that you did it and look at what happened. So I'm really glad that you did that that day, really. So, Bill, you get this call from this desperate man and you are in your office at Dahlonega Baptist Church as the pastor and the phone rings. Yeah, my administrative assistant, Diane King, answered the phone and I was in my study and the door was closed, but uh, she interrupted my time. And she said, Bill, there's some man who's distraught. He's sobbing on the phone and says he needs to speak to a pastor. So I said, okay. So I took the phone call, and indeed, Carl was on the other end. I didn't know Carl. He didn't know me. Uh, To this day, I don't know who recommended it, but someone told him 
at work, I believe it was. That That's correct. He needed to go see the pastor at Dahlonega Baptist Church. So I said, sure, come on. And uh, I don't know, a little while later, in walks Carl, and he comes into my study, a broken man. He told me his story, a capsulated version of it, which was mostly at that moment about the TPO, Temporary Protective Order, about how he couldn't see his wife. He thought he'd lost his wife. He was afraid he'd lost his son. It, it was killing him. He knew that drugs did it. And his question to me was, how can I get them back? And I kind of looked at Carl at that moment. I said, Carl, I don't know how you're going to get them back because Penny is not here. I can't talk to her. Your son is not here. I can't talk to him. I'm talking to you. I said, if there's any hope, there is one thing that I think you can do and that you can turn your life over to the one who can change your life. And if your life changes, that's the only thing you are in control of. The rest of it is up to your wife and to your son. Are you willing to do that? And he was at rock bottom. And at that moment, he said, yes. So I just talked to him about what it means to trust Christ with one's life. And I knew enough from what Carl had told me, though he would tell me a lot more later, that there was so much guilt and so much, as he calls it, cowardice, but the addiction, um, so much of life that he had missed out on that he needed that grace. And we talked about how he would be a new creature if he would just surrender his life and allow God to lead him through this and asked him if he was willing to, to trust God's love for him. And weeping, he said, yes, and he did. And uh, I said, okay. At that moment, there was absolutely no lights and angelic choirs or anything like that. Carl calmed down a bit. I said to him, the next thing you need to do is to act on this now. You need to come to worship. You know, just come be a part of a community. He had been a part of a community before that, but that community was not going to help him move beyond addiction and beyond the lifestyle he had. And so we, we talked about that, and, and I said, so I'll see you Sunday? Yes. But then he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. How am I going to win Penny back? <laughs> and I said, Carl... I know where you're living, about right across the road from her. I said, she's going to have to witness the change in your life. And you're going to have to start back with her, courting her as if it were your first date. And you've got to treat her with more respect than you've ever treated her. And you've got to show her the change that is taking place in your life. And he said he'd do that. And he did. And there was great change. What I didn't know from that moment, and you know, I'd been pastoring for a long time by that time, but uh, what I didn't know in that moment is that God had delivered him from drug addiction. Now, this man sitting in front of me was mainlining, and he told me one time, he said, Bill, he said, I loved it so much that if I didn't get drugs, I would shoot up warm water in my vein. But from that day, which was December the 15th, 2009, it was a Tuesday. Um, he may have been tempted, as we talked about just before this podcast, he and I. He may have been tempted, but he never had to go back to that. There was something in his life that replaced that God of the opiates and methamphetamine. He got rid of a false god, and the real god came into his life and began to reorder it and change it. Uh, and I can tell you that I realized that he was a changed man later, but two, 2011 or 12, your, your jaw was broken. 2012. 
2012, Carl's playing on the softball team for the church, and he has a mishap on the field and breaks his jaw, and it has to be wired together. And the doctor was going to give him pain medication, and he said, no, I can't take that. And so he went home with his jaw wired shut and no pain medication, and Tylenol wouldn't touch it. And he called me one day on the phone sobbing and through you know, a wired jaw, he said, I just can't take it anymore. What do I do? Carl, I will pray with you, but you do what you have to to get by and let us talk regularly. Because I was very afraid that if he took any kind of opiate, which is often what they give for this kind of pain, that it would spin him right back into that uh, addiction cycle. But um, I don't know, three or four days you took that, and that was it. You didn't take all that he gave you. And when he came out of that and did not have desire to go back into his addiction, I knew he had been absolutely delivered from that. And, and I'll tell you, for all the people I've prayed for in my life, it's the first time I'd ever seen one actually delivered from something like this. But uh, I know it. Uh, he and I have talked on many occasions between then. And there were one time I remember going down the road and Carl called me and he said, Bill, you got to pray for him. He said, things are tough. And he said, I hadn't felt this need to go back to drugs any more than today since I became a follower of Jesus. And so we prayed and he went through it and didn't do it. He trusted the Lord and and he didn't get failed. He was not failed. That that trust, that faith. Um. So I just I rambled. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I love it. I love hearing that side, Bill and Carl. After this podcast, we got to talk about why you missed that ball to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about some baseball, and I'm like, how the heck did you miss that ball that you broke for your job? That was a very hot shot, I promise you. <laughs> okay. I was trying to save him from that embarrassment. <laughs> Thanks, I'll believe Bill. you. I'll believe I you. I think what happened is he was looking at that ugly yellow orange tee that's on the oh, his oh. leg there. And he oh. got distracted. And, but, you know, I've tried to tell him he needs to get that thing erased <laughs> off his leg. And this is coming from an old dog. <laughs> okay. SEC football here. Okay. But those who are listening over in Canada, Japan, it's called SEC football. It Correct. is its own religion in the South. <laughs> None of that. To get back to where we were, <laughs> can you share, Carl, any insights on the importance of forgiveness in the process of restoration? Forgiveness. Uh Yes, insight and forgiveness. It was amazing that, that day would build, uh, you know, my life changed dramatically. I became a different person that day. And uh, it's like I told y'all before, when I walked out of the doors of this church, it was like the first time I could breathe clearly. And as I got escaped the addiction, my mind started clearing up. And my wife started forgiving me. I was forgiven that day of all the wrongs that I had done that day when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior because he took care of all that on the cross. And forgiveness is one of the hardest things you will ever do in your life for you to forgive someone. And for my family to forgive me for all the turmoil and the hurt and all that I put them through. That was a beautiful thing. And uh, it's hard to forgive someone after you've hurt them, you know? Uh, and I'm sure anyone can relate to that, but that's very critical in any relationship to be able to forgive. You know, you can forgive, but you never forget. So forgiveness was for my wife and my family, my son, to forgive me for all that and love me still unconditionally was very important. Do you remember the day that Nick told you he forgave you for the first time? I do. I do. I remember that day really well, and uh, it was hard for me to 
really believe it that first time. What was it like, Nick, for you to tell your dad that after you saw him and after you forgave him? Uh, uh, it's really hard to explain, really, in my, in my opinion. Uh, because, you know, I mean, he was never there when I was younger, mostly. He was usually doped up on drugs or something or not in the picture. When he started going to church, I seen a change in him. And I was like, hey, this is something that's actually helping him. And then that's when in my heart, I feel I truly forgave him. When I seen him just go cold turkey and drop everything down and worry about his family and God. Did you feel loved by your dad when he was finally able to do this? Because he was doing it essentially for himself, yes, but for you and your mom at that point. Yeah, I did. I want to interject here is from the pastor's point of view, outside looking in, all of that forgiveness that Nick and Penny and others gave Carl was a lot easier for Carl to accept than for him to forgive himself. We have talked about that time and time and time again because as you said, you can't forget. And I think this is one of those spiritual beachheads that we have to fight on is this place where those memories are brought back up and brought back up in such a way that we have to deal with it. You weren't used to dealing with things like that. And yeah. knowing what you had done to Nick and to Penny, even though you were that was the old man and you were a new man. It was hardest for that grace to sink down to that place in your heart. Um, still going there. And I wanted to say, Nick, you know, you kept struggling. I, I, I thought Carl to talk about your dad convincing yourself as much as anybody. He loved you. I love Nick with all my heart. You said, but before you were delivered from that addiction and you were living your life of faith, most of your heart was taken up with addiction. Before your dad became clean, most of his heart. So what heart he could give you was not as much as he could give you later. And what heart he, Nick, that Carl can give you now is a whole lot more of his heart. It's more available to you now because that idol has been removed and it's been filled with something else that he can share. So I am I know that you have memories. Memories are hard. But the good news is he does have more room in his heart now and he's shown you that. And by your forgiving, you're removing something from your heart that gives room for God to put love there that would be blocked. That's why forgiveness is important for each of us to forgive, whether the other person accepts it or not, it's because it gets in the way of God filling our heart with his love. Mm. So uh, I just wanted to interject that, yeah, forgiveness is a huge issue. The the greatest part of that forgiveness was Carl's willingness to accept it for himself, to forgive himself. And that's still a struggle sometimes, but he's doing better. I am. Well, and I think that, Carl, one of the reasons that your story is so compelling is because it's universal, not just for those who are dealing with drugs, but also going through difficult times, whether it be with family or personal or uh, in your case that you deal with every day, homelessness. There's so many demons out there far beyond the drugs. And I think part of the film is that it is universal and people don't walk away going, oh, look at the look at the drug addict who changed. That's not what this film is about. It, ultimately, it's your story, but it's a witness story. And I want to share a quote that I received um, from a pastor who saw the film. Um, I realized that this is Carl's story and it is central. However, what strikes me about the project is we can find our place in the story. 
there is a place to connect. As a father, the opportunity to connect is obvious. As a human being, the struggle is real. As a pastor, I see God moving through each aspect. And for Carl and his family, God is moving to heal, restore, and author a story that only he can tell. Finally, for the audience, and this is very important, I think his story is an invitation to breathe deep the grace of God, to receive it, and to apply it to life, family, and others. Bill, I'm going to ask you this question. What about Carl's story is truly universal in what you see today? It may not be the most obvious thing, but one of the things Carl and Penny and Nick have had to learn that I try to talk to couples about as we're building a relationship is that we need to come to the place where we can trust the love. And you're going back to Penny and showing her this side of you, this new man. It, it was an opportunity for her to begin to trust you in a way that she had not been able to trust you before. When Nick started coming to worship with you, and then Nick was moved to faith because, in, in large measure, because he'd seen this change in his dad, and then when Penny started coming to worship with you, and then she came to faith as well, I think that was a huge issue in learning to trust the love. First of all, you got to learn how to trust God's love for you, and then you have to learn how to trust God's love in your partner, in your parent. And when we can get to the place where we can learn to trust each other's love, but until we learn, and that takes a lot of vulnerability and transparency, and, and there's, that's a fearful thing, <laughs> especially when you first do it, but when you you get to that point of vulnerability and transparency and you can see something genuine in your partner and you witness how your partner reacts to you in a new way that is selfless. You know, you called it unconditional, that Nick had unconditional love for you. That's when we learned how to trust the love. And that's the best witness you can have for your children, for your larger family for your community um, because there are not a lot of people out there who can trust love. Nick, after all of this that you've gone through and the experience you've had, what do you see for yourself as a father in the future? Uh, I think I'll be a pretty good dad because, I mean, my dad was there for me when he, when he was going through a hard time. And so, I mean, I believe my, my son or my daughter would do the same for me. I love that that's the vision that you have after everything that you've gone through as well. And I applaud that you accept the difference of you and your sister had. So I think that's incredible. Grandpa Carl. It's got a nice ring to it. No comment. Matt, Scott, I don't even know the words to describe what you have done with this film. You took hours and hours and hours of film and you had to make the story. And he and I were on the receiving end a couple of times of, I'm sobbing. And there were multiple discussions with, I don't know which way to go. There's so many happy moments. There's so much heartbreak. There's so much trauma. There's so much that you can't breathe. How did this film change you? Wow. It definitely, it made me think a lot more about old friends who have been in this kind of situation with drugs. And it really reminded me of a few friends from high school who got into heroin and stuff and ended up uh, dropping out of college. And they, they had to uh, go to methadone clinics and stuff like that. And their whole life just changed just because of doing that drug all the time. And one of those friends actually passed away because of that, like a year ago. It just made me think about them more and just made me think about 
putting this message out there and getting people to not do that to themselves. You're going to die. And there, there are people who care about you who don't want you to die. And there were a lot of hard parts that we had to, because of the film festival rules, had to pull a lot out. And um, it was very painful because there's so much depth to the story and very grateful that we're going to continue down this path to continue on and do a full feature. But as you broke apart each and every one of these scenes and every part of this interview, you have an incredible resume of what you have done. And this was different, though, not just for your friend, but it was different. It really tugged on your heartstrings. What made you make the decisions because you were the magician in the end? I pretty much started out listening to everything. And then I have my notebook with time code and all the notes of all the sound bites and stuff. But really, it was kind of choosing the music and the kind of mood of it and the tone, trying to figure out what kind of tone and everything with it. And then once the music got in there, just making the flow go and then just telling the story with the music and everything. That's why I, I like asked you what you listened to back then. You said Led Zeppelin. Yeah. And that's why I chose. <laughs> with the long hair. Girls with the long thing. hair and the girls, yeah. <laughs> couldn't really, we couldn't use a Led Zeppelin song. It cost a lot <laughs> for that. But uh, Karen and I sang it for you, don't we? We did. <laughs> we sang it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Just try to make it as good as possible. What do you want people to take away from this film? I don't want to spoil it. At the end, it's like just thinking about people who have the addiction and stuff. And don't ignore that. Try to help those kind of people. Yeah, I think that's a strong message to have. Karen told me about how uh, some old friends have reached out to you and stuff. Like, what all have they talked about with you? Uh it's not that they've talked about it. I know tomorrow night there's going to be some folks that I introduced as drugs and that are still possibly using drugs. So it's put some seeds in their hearts. There's something stirring, and I think it's God. Uh, and that's all he calls us to do is plant seed. And I know after they see this film, it's going to give them hope. You know, it's, it's going to, with God stirring in their heart, he will water that seed. And we may never see the fruit of this movie and who it touches in the future, but uh, that's not for us. It's for the glory of God anyway. But uh, yes, uh, they're not saying much, but their interest is stirring. So uh, it's going to be good, man. I think that is a huge part of the story is that it doesn't, it's not Carl. It's Carl's son, Nick, and how that affects him going forward. It's Angel going forward. It's his wife going forward, sister, everyone that was a part of his life at that time and how they choose to move forward with their own life and how that will continue to affect them. And so I just think it is such a good reminder that it, it's your support system and it's how you act and your actions that will make a difference. And I think, Carl, you know, Key and I talked to you before. It's like, what do you want people to take away from this film? And no matter where it goes. And full disclosure here, you haven't seen the film. So. No, I would not. The uh, producers would not let me have nothing to do with that. I've just seen the trailer as well as everyone else. And it's been about to. Uh, tear me up inside so i'm like oh my goodness i've got to wait till the night of so but if it makes you feel any better we've been incredibly nervous from our side we have to show you how much you were loved by us and you really should know and in time you will understand the impact that this film made on the crew. And there was a lot of people who had their hands in the pot here and there that you don't even know about and you'll never meet. But the gratitude that we have 
for you to trust us. And I will say this, there are no coincidences. You and I were supposed to meet in, it was a short time, but I think that he and I just kind of want to know, hey, this is a small town and while there are some people who know your story, I think the question we want to know is you are confident that the story needed to be told. I know that. But how do you plan to start your life Tuesday morning after everyone sees your story, hears your story, but not the drug addict, but Carl, the one who can minister to those who are hurting, the story behind it, the one who can make the connections, the one who can help people open doors, even if they have no past like yours, your life is going to change. Also the one that was named the most cherished citizen oh, of Oh, yes, Dahlonega and the one that was the named newspaper. the most cherished citizen of Dahlonega. I'm not getting over it. Yeah. <laughs> what is Carl going to be like Tuesday morning moving forward as this story gets out to so many people worldwide? Carl's not going to change Tuesday morning. Carl will be Carl. But Carl's story will show on display of what God can do in a man's life when he turns it over. You know, the name of, of this movie is My First Breath, the story of Carl Gibson. It's actually not the story of Carl Gibson. It's actually the story of what God did in Carl Gibson's life. Because if it wasn't for his grace and his mercy and love and this man... Bill Hutchison beside me on December 15th, 2009, showing me, opening that door for a drug addict to walk through in God's house and showing me that day what God's love was for me, even as an addict. This story wouldn't have ever been possible. But Tuesday morning, I will wake up as Carl Gibson. But the world will know what God can do if you just give it to him. And that's what we did that day in Bill Hutchison's office. We laid it all on the floor that day. And I wish you could have felt the peace that came over me that day when this man prayed over me. You cannot put words on that peace that came over me that day. And that's why I told you when I walked out of this church doors that day, it felt like I could breathe for the first time. But Tuesday morning, I hope after people see this story, it gives them hope, gives them a hunger to find out more of where that peace came from for me, and that was through God. So, I want to just share one thing, Carl, and I know you just emphasize that this isn't your story. It's very much families included. Yes. And I want to make it very clear that your daughter doesn't know your story, and she's seeing it for the very first time tomorrow. And you commented earlier today that you are nervous about the perspective, not only for you, but for your family. Yes. What does uh, that mean? Well, Nick, he lived the story, you know. He was the game changer. He was the hero in all this. Angel, who was born in 2010, and my life changed in 2009, so she knows nothing much about my drug addiction and my drug days. So this little girl thinks I hung the moon already, and I've sit her down since feminist documentary. I have sit down with her and, and told her that she's going to find out some things that she never knew about her dad. And... Uh, when I told her, she says, I don't care because I love you. And uh, and I hope everyone else perceives that as well. It sees it tomorrow night that their perspective of me doesn't change. But I have asked for forgiveness for what I've done. And if folks can't accept that, I'm sorry. But I have laid it all down and 
I've got to move on and be Carl Gibson and be there for my family, be there for my church, and be there mainly just to do God's will in life, you know? I don't want to look over this. I want people to know that this young man that is sitting to my left, Nick Gibson, you will forever be my hero. And you never, ever feel ashamed or saddened because you save someone's life out of love, just loving them. You never gave up on Carl. The church didn't give up on Carl. This community of Dahlonega, Georgia, never gave up on Carl. But son, I will say it till I can't say it anymore. You are a hero. And I am so proud of you for loving unconditionally because that's what it should be. That's what life should be. And that's what we should all learn from this film. And I will tell you, you said it, Carl. You said it. You don't want anyone to give up on someone. And I think that's the most important thing. The short film is called My First Breath, the story of Carl Gibson. Nick, you know that your life will change, and we know that you are the reason that we are here tonight. Ultimately, you were a tool that allowed your family to emerge. Bill, I wish everyone had your heart. I do. You've got such a beautiful heart. I wish every person and every church had a bill. I do, that could reach out and could unconditionally love. Carl, God bless you. We're proud of you. To Angel, Carl's daughter, and Penny, his beautiful wife, we have been blessed to be part of this film in our lives. And to Matt, you create the magic man. We love you so much, and thank you. And there's more yet to come. So. I'm really excited for tomorrow, and I just want to thank you. And Carl, I just wanted to say that you are an amazing father, and look at what you've created. So I just wanted to say everyone showing up for you tomorrow, you're doing such a good job, and we love you. Thank you. Love you. My first breath for those who need to get in touch with us to get a hold of this film. We'll put all that in the show notes. And until then, keep the faith, Carl, Nick, Pastor Bill. Matt, I love you, Kia. I love you, Karen. <laughs> Carl, let's go for some practice on the field. We're going to do some catches. <laughs> nice shot there, Kia. <laughs> I had to do one more. We'll see you soon. <laughs>